and to not keep us waiting too long, I think I'll just start kicking us off. For anybody that's newer joining us, this is a panelist structure conversation. Um, so we are uh, gonna be the, the panelists with Dr. Quinn Davidson and Dr. Gross are gonna be the ones visible, but everyone can participate via the chat function. I really encourage you to use that as a forum for conversation, forum to introduce yourselves. And if you have any technical issues, um, you can always use that chat function there too to help resolve those. Um, and we have some extra additional folks monitoring the chat. So thank you all. Um, so I will uh, try to kick us off here um, at a time of 11 or 104. Um, so first, before we dive into some introductions and the rest of um, our conversation, I do want to kick us off with a um, land acknowledgement. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm lucky enough to be speaking to you all from uh, the land of the Denina people here in Anchorage. Um, this is the unceded ancestral home um, of the Denina people who are the past, the present, and the future caretakers of this land and waters. And I think it's especially important to acknowledge that history and that contextualization and our placement in that has history um, as we dive into a deeper discussion about a really precious resource of all of ours, uh, which is salmon and fish. Um, so really happy to be acknowledging that. Um, then I also want to just give you guys um, a kind of rundown of the purpose of our conversation, what we're trying to do here. Um, I will humble myself at the very beginning. I am not a doctor, neither medical nor uh, environmental. Um, I am not a scientist. So I have a very um, lay person's understanding. And what I'm hoping to do is have a conversation with these two lovely doctors who are um, gracing us with their time and with their presence um, to understand this issue a little bit more, to acknowledge that we're not going to be experts in the next hour, but we can all become a little more informed. Um, and this is an opportunity to think deeply and have um, some sort of deep conversations there. Um, so to give you a rundown of what we're hoping to do, uh, I'll spend a little bit of time setting the stage just super, super briefly. For the panelists, I have about five questions for discussion that I'll prompt you with. Um, and then we'll have about 20 minutes um, for discussion with um, questions from all of you, and I'm sure there'll be many more than we can even answer. Um, so we'll just try to get done what we can in this hour. Um, so that is the rundown. Um, and uh, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce myself. And I promise that I'll let you guys speak really, really soon. Um, so my name is Jenny Marie. I am the political and campaigns director here for the Alaska Center. Um, I'll be conducting this conversation to move us forward. Again, humbling myself, neither a doctor. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, my perspective can kind of be useful because if I don't understand what you guys are saying, I will let you know very quickly and we'll try to keep our level of conversation um, at one that is really um, intelligible and accessible. And that's kind of the purpose series here at the Alaska Center is to open up these really hard topics to um, something that we can all kind of take a bite on and chew with a little bit deeper. Um, so with that, um, before I kick off with some stage setting, I will do a really brief introduction for um, Dr. Quinn Davidson and Dr. Gross, and I'll let you guys kind of flesh that out yourselves too. Um, so firstly, um, I'm so pleased that Dr. Gross can join us. Dr. Gross is a, a commercial fisherman, a doctor. He is running for the US Senate in Alaska. He is a lifelong Alaskan, um, a wonderful person. And I'm really pleased that he can join us. And with that, Al, I'll let you um, kick off with a little bit of a personal introduction um, so folks can get to know you too. Well, th thanks, Jenny Marie. And, and thank you all for being part of this. And thank you, Dr. Quinn Davidson. Um, I'm a doctor. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not a climatologist, but I do have a strong understanding uh, and appreciation for science. And I'm very honored to have been endorsed recently by the Alaska Center in my bid for the U.S. Senate. And I got to know Jenny Marie almost a whole year ago when she was working for the Ship Creek Group. And I um, stepped forward to do this. And then we've uh, since gone separate directions. But I'm happy to work with you again. 
And yeah, I'm a bone doctor and a commercial fisherman. I grew up commercial fishing uh, in Southeast Alaska. I ended up commercial fishing all across the state in the Gulf of Alaska, Bristol Bay. My daughter Ariana fished in Bristol Bay commercially. Uh, I've got a deep uh, uh, sense of respect for hardworking Alaskans through that experience. Uh, when I went from full-time orthopedics to part-time in 2013, when I went back to get my master's in public health, uh, that I got back into commercial fishing and I have a, a gillnetter in Southeast Alaska uh, and have been commercial fishing out of Southeast for the, uh, or since 2013, although that's obviously on hold while I run for the U.S. Senate and uh, probably the end of my commercial fishing career because I really think we're in a very strong position to win this seat. Uh, we launched our campaign in July. We've had a tremendous fundraising success. Our campaign has uh, repeatedly been upgraded by a number of uh, political uh, ratings organizations. James Carville just came out last week and predicted that we're going to win the race. And Nestler.org is predicting that we can win the race by as many as eight points. So I stepped up to do this because I knew I could win this race. And it's important enough to me that to get Alaska going back in the right direction, because, you know, I grew up really in the shadow of Jay Hammond. Jay Hammond was a very close friend of, of mine, of our families. I spent a lot of time uh, with my father and Jay Hammond while they created uh, many of the programs in the state uh, throughout my teenage years and seeing what's ha happening to Alaska and uh, seeing the writing on the wall for the future of Alaska really made me uh, want to get involved, uh, something I did not really envision myself as being part of. Uh, 15 years ago, but as I got older and saw the state um, start to decline and our country split apart, I just felt like I was the right person at the right time to step up and do this. And, and I do care a lot about both. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. I feel very humbled uh, in the company of Dr. Quinn Davidson. I'm certainly no climatologist, but I very much um, am aware of climate change and want to work as our Senator to do everything we can uh, to mitigate it and to uh, prevent it from uh, um, uh, getting worse and to move towards renewable clean energy uh, where, whenever and wherever we, we can. And as a senator, I will be all ears to this audience as to how I can best do that. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Gross. Um, and next, I'll, I'll give um, Dr. Quinn Davidson a moment to introduce herself. Um, I'm lucky enough to know Dr. Quinn Davidson from a while back, too. Um, she is the president of the Alaska chapter of American Fisheries Society. She's been working on fisheries uh, or in fisheries on the Yukon um, for eight years. Um, she is a uh, a wonderful, wonderful scientist, also a wonderful human, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to introduce yourself to you, Steph. Thanks, Jenny Marie. That's very sweet of you. And uh, happy to be here um, for this conversation today and with Dr. Al Gross. Uh, to be clear, I'm not a climatologist. Uh, I just kind of stumbled into uh, this issue, I guess, because um, it forced me to. Um, I've been working on the Yukon River <clears throat> for eight years in different capacities. I originally started out working uh, for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, both as a research biologist and then as a fishery manager on the Yukon River. And I now work for a large tribal organization on the, rep on the river. Um, we represent over 30 federally recognized tribes. Uh, the Yukon River is the largest migration of salmon in the state. Uh, the salmon are coming in right now. Unfortunately, they're coming in, in in low numbers, and we've got our fingers crossed that this run is uh, possibly late rather than just low. Uh, these salmon, the king salmon, they make a 1,500-mile journey to their spawning grounds, which is pretty incredible when you think about that. They uh, they swim from the mouth of the Yukon River up to the border uh, with Canada in 30 days, which is just unreal that they're swimming against the current upriver and making that trek in, in 30 days. And that is just one of the many reasons why I continue to work on the Yukon River. It's just a phenomenal place. And I love the people all along the river. I love working with them, love working uh, for them and advocating for their uh, fishing, uh, traditional fishing lifestyles. 
Awesome. Thank you both. I'm so happy um, to have both of you joining us for this conversation. Um, and FYI to all the attendees too, we also have um, some tech specialists, uh, Ryan and Chanel joining us from the Alaska Center. Those are little names you see in addition to panelists. So if any technological issues go wrong, I will call on those two to solve them for us. Um, so first, I want to kick us off with a little bit of table setting. I know that um, Dr. Quinn Davidson and Dr. Gross um, have laid out um, a couple of the high level um, uh, understanding of this conversation that we're about to have, right? Um, but I think uh, just so we're all starting from the same place, and I think most of these uh, attendees know um, just as deeply as I do, if not better, um, that we know that salmon has a huge economic impact. And when I say economy, I want to be rooted in an understanding of the economy that's defined contextually through the traditional meaning. So eco, the root, um, means home in Greek, um, oikos, and nami means management. So this is really an economy, um, economic understanding can be the management of the relationships to our home. And our relationship to salmon, as we know as Alaskans, goes deep, it goes centuries and centuries backwards. It's the lifeblood of so many of our communities, particularly our indigenous communities across Alaska. Um, and we also know that salmon has a deep relationship to our economy from a more typical Western definition. Um, Alaska is hugely reliant on salmon. Our fisheries support nearly 36,000 Alaskan jobs, produce nearly 5 billion in economic output. So it's really hard here to over emphasize the deep relationship and reliance um, on uh, the Alaskan relationship to salmon and salmon's relationship to Alaska. Um, it's also going to be really, really hard, but I'm going to try to do it to briefly contextualize the threats we're facing now. Um, again, you could spend your whole life studying this topic. I'd refer you to Dr. Quinn Davidson if you want to become more of an expert um, and not to myself, but um, I know that you all have been reading um, news nonstop about climate impacts um, on our whole state and that includes salmon. Um, we're going to paste a few links in the chat here just to help folks catch up to speed, but we're facing major changes on every level ranging from ocean acidification, which is right now faster than any time on the record, um, to melting glaciers and warming temperatures. Um, I'm sure you all remember last summer, um, astonishingly, Alaska for the first time in a 95 time, 95 year long record had a July to June average temperature of just over freezing, which we haven't seen in the state in 95 years. Um, and we all personally remember, at least I remember, a lot of uh, shorts and t-shirts and hot weather. Um, and presciently, additionally, um, our fisheries uh, have had good returns recently, like Bristol Bay's second largest harvest um, on record uh, in 2019. But we also know that salmon are dying and salmon are facing threats that we haven't seen before. And these include everything that I'm sure we'll dive into, but I will play just a really short video to catch us up to speed on some of the news discovered last year um, from a really, really warm summer that uh, Dr. Quinn Davidson and many other scientists um, helped discover. So I'm going to share my screen here um, to do that. And that's right here. And can you Those poor fish. Allow Alaska is hotter than ever this summer, and salmon are dying because of it. Oops. CNN reports that large amounts of salmon are dying off in Alaska due to the unprecedented heat wave that gripped the state in July and caused water temperatures to reach up to 81.7 degrees Fahrenheit. In a Twitter post, Yukon Intertribal Fish Commission Director Stephanie Quinn Davidson said she and other scientists counted 850 dead chum salmon when they checked a 200-mile stretch of river during a July expedition. According to The Independent, it's normal for salmon to die off after they spawn. But since most of the dead fish were found with healthy eggs still in their bodies, scientists believed they died of heat stress before reaching their spawning grounds. According to Sue Mauger, science director for the Cook Inlet Keeper, fish can't get oxygen moving through their bellies in warm water. Temperature can also affect metabolism and organ function, making the fish less able to fight off parasites and pathogens. 
The Independent reports that scientists stopped seeing dead salmon as soon as the temperatures cooled back down. According to CNN, extreme heat brought about by climate change isn't the only thing stressing North American salmon populations. In southwestern Canada and northwestern Washington, salmon are being threatened by overfishing. A mining project in Alaska that's no longer being opposed by the EPA could also devastate one of the world's most valuable wild salmon fisheries. So thank you all for watching that with me. It's just a brief moment uh, with some uh, really wild narration sounds, but um, still valuable, I think, to um, just take a brief look at some of those photos, especially um, that Dr. Quinn Davidson and others were able to capture um, that I think can help contextualize the problem that we're dealing with, again, which is climate change. So it's writ large and this conversation could go on forever, but um, we'll try to keep it to just an hour. Um, so to kick us off for a conversation, um, I think you both started to talk about this, but can you just contextualize a little more um, your background on thinking about salmon and your relationship to salmon? Um, so I'd love, uh, I'll let actually you guys choose who goes first. <laughs> I'll start, I guess. Is that okay? Um, well, first of all, seeing all those pictures of the salmon make me really want to eat one. Living in Anchorage, we don't get, I don't have the opportunity to go out and fishing for king salmon the way I used to down in Southeast. So uh, that's the one downside of running for the Senate. We moved up to Anchorage three years ago from Southeast to explore doing this. Uh, but I've, I've been around salmon my whole life. I grew up sport fishing, uh, fly fishing uh, in rivers and in the men started commercial fishing when I was uh, just 14 and salmon have been a huge part of my life. All four of my kids have commercial fished for salmon uh, for at least five summers each and put themselves through college. Um, and so being out on a boat, being out on the water, um, I spent a lot of time out in the ocean. Uh, even offshore, um, it, great distances. I've got a, a very, very strong uh, 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 both experience and respect for, for our ocean and our, our rivers that produce the salmon. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I remember they logged all the way down to uh, the rivers in southeast Alaska and uh, that with no respect for the watersheds. And that's changed, of course, but for a long time, our, our salmon runs down there were uh, really being um, uh, badly devastated by the logging industry. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's an amazing circle of life. It, 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 it never ceases to impress me. And no matter how many times I'm around it, seeing salmon coming back to the river that where they were born is just one of the most impressive uh, things in life and in biology that, that anyone could, can imagine really to go out to sea that far and then find their way home is just really amazing. Uh, so we have to do everything we can to um, uh, promote and, and support and protect um, our, 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 our cultural way of life, our fisheries, our, our the economy through fisheries. And, you know, the Chukchi Sea was 10 degrees warmer than normal last summer, north of Uktiagbek. And, um, you know, we, we need to be very concerned about this issue, clearly. And at one point, um, I was on a sailing trip. I took a two-year sabbatical, um, and Monica and I sold our house in Juneau, bought a big sailboat, and sailed with our four kids uh, to New Zealand and back. And on our way back, we sailed through the biggest garbage patch uh, known to man about 1,500 miles offshore in California, offshore from California. There was three days of traveling through garbage in the ocean. It was one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. And we literally had to dodge bullets to get uh, to get home. Uh, so you know, um, you know whether plastics are going to impact our fisheries. That you know, some people debate that, but we we can't be polluting our oceans. That's for sure, and we can't be acidifying them either uh, if we want to keep a fishery. Guess I'll go next. <laughs> um, yeah, like I said in my introduction, I've been working on the Yukon River for the last eight years. Um, a lot of my experience and knowledge has been, of course, uh, Yukon specific. Uh, I've been a little more involved in, in statewide issues. Uh, the last few years, um, I was an Alaska Salmon Fellow through the Humanities Forum. 
um, that program brought together diverse groups of people to from all different sectors of the salmon system to talk about uh, difficult issues around salmon. Um, and that was a really uh, educational experience for me and got to make a lot of connections with different people across all different sectors. Um, and, uh, and then working on the Stand for Salmon campaign as one of the main sponsors, uh, citizen sponsors of that campaign uh, definitely helped me involved in some statewide issues. Um, in terms of you know, climate change in salmon, I actually hadn't been thinking about it that much uh, naively. Um, sort of, I feel like in Alaska, a lot of times we feel a little immune to everything that's going on because we're so far away and Alaska is so pristine and our ecosystems are still so intact. We often have this uh, Alaska exceptionalism uh, toward a lot of things like, oh, you know, we just have so many fish out there. It's okay if, if something you know, small happens to them. Uh, they'll recover, but so I hadn't really been thinking about climate change until it was forced on me last summer uh, when we started hearing reports of large die-offs of, of summer chum salmon on the river. And, uh, and then we went out and investigated and like that uh, video said, you know, we counted over 800, but we estimated that there were likely thousands, possibly tens of thousands that had actually died on the river. And that experience I mean, it was a little bittersweet because here I was on this beautiful river boating down, just beautiful scenery, and I love being on the river. But then seeing all of these salmon washed up on the shores, having not spawned, nothing seemingly wrong with them, uh, except that they were just dead. And that was really hard to see. It was really heartbreaking. And uh, in that Twitter post, I think, or Facebook post, I can't remember which, I think I said, you know, um, climate change is here in Alaska. We're feeling it. I mean, at the time, like Jenny said, we were shorts and, and t-shirts and tank tops. Uh, we were seeing it and our salmon are dying because of it. Uh, and that was just a, I think a real gut punch for me last summer. So that's how I've been forced into it now. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both for that. Um, I think the next thing I, I, I want to prompt you both to talk about is, um, you know, I think when we think of this issue, it's so large scale that it can be hard to conceive of. So I'd love to kind of think more, um, not granular, but more refined down to who are the communities that are impacted by salmon's relationship to climate change? Who are most impacted, who are most at risk, and how can we see that affecting our economies and our cultures? And I think I'll kick it off with Dr. Quinn Davidson. Darn. <laughs> That's such a, a light one, <laughs> just a little, just a, a snowball. Just a big question. Um, I mean, obviously I'm thinking about this in the context of the tribes that I represent along the Yukon River. Um, and just what we're seeing in terms of climate change, you know, not only is climate change impacting um, the salmon dying off, meaning there's fewer of them out there, but it's changing their run timing. It's changing when the salmon enter the river. So um, typically harvests along the river are higher in June because that's really good drying weather. And that's a good time to put your fish up on the racks and you're not going to have flies and it's good uh, dry, windy weather. You start to get into July and August and things get rainy and your fish can spoil. And because of climate change, we're actually seeing a shift in when salmon enter the river. And it's impacting people's ability to adequately store their fish or process their fish because then it's happening at times when the weather's not very good. Um, so that's, uh, you know, a direct impact in addition to affecting the population size. It's also impacting how the salmon are swimming in the river. So where people are fishing, where they're putting their nets, they're not catching salmon in those places that they've maybe caught salmon for for generations where their family has had fish camp for years and years. Um, the salmon are swimming deeper. They're trying to find colder, cooler water. And that's impacting people's ability to go out and fish. And when you have gas prices that are six, seven, eight dollars a gallon, and you have to spend a lot of your time trying to find where the fish are um, and learn 
where the fish are, you know, that can, uh, that really starts to add up um, for our communities out in rural Alaska. So I'm coming at, from, coming at it from that lens, you know, certainly it could impact our economy. I think uh, there was just an article in High Country News um, about uh, the warming on the Ugashik River and all the sockeye salmon that died off on the Ugashik, Ugashik River. And I believe they estimated that it was about $1 million lost to fishermen on the Ugashik. I can't ever say that alone. So, you know, I think it's gonna impact our, um, our communities that rely primarily on these traditional food resources a lot in many different ways. And it's going to impact anyone who's out there fishing for a living and trying to make their way and, and provide uh, an economy here in Alaska. Thank you, Dr. Ben Davidson. Um, Dr. Gross, can I, can I prompt you to talk a little bit about, um, I think, you know, maybe Stephanie stole the thunder, but um, who, who and how we see this issue affecting us now? Well, it's such a vast topic in the state because it affects everyone in the state. You know, you know, if it's not direct, it's indirect, you know, through tourism, uh, support industries, sport fishing, commercial fishing. But the direct, you know, the small villages along the rivers, uh, the tribes, uh, the Alaska natives that live in small, small villages will be most directly impacted if we lose the runs. And I'm, you know, Bristol Bay has been very productive over the last few years. Uh, that bubble's got to burst at some point. I can't uh, believe that with our changing ocean climate, uh, that the threats to that fishery won't eventually um, be uh, or, or um, be evident. And you know, but I but I worry a lot about our king salmon runs, our wild king runs. And while bit, while Bristol Bay is still doing well, the wild king runs across the state are not. And there's debate as to uh, why they're not but there seems to be general consensus that something is going on out in the ocean uh, that's um, um, putting our, our king salmon runs at risk and whether or not it's bycatch through the trawlers or uh, um, competition for food supply or warming or ocean acidification, we don't know yet. Uh, but I do know that uh, the salmon behavior patterns uh, have changed significantly in fish in general in the Gulf of Alaska. I've been going to North Pacific Fisheries Management Council meetings for the last couple of years and watching the science presentations of migration patterns of the fish in our in our in the Gulf. And they're all moving north, uh, and that is going to affect uh, you know um, the the life cycle of these fish for sure. Uh, but I think that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen to Bristol Bay over the next uh, five years. I have a lot of friends who are putting three quarters of a million dollars into new boats up there and whether or not we're going to be able to continue catching 40 million sockeye a year from those rivers remains to be seen. I certainly hope so. Yeah, and I, I think I, you know, I'd love to kind of contextualize as we're understanding this, there's a couple questions being asked in the chat that I think are important to understand. And one is, you know, what's being done to monitor our current situation now and into the future. And I'd love to get just kind of like a lay person's understanding of that, because I know um, people like yourselves, Dr. Quinn Davidson's, you know, are doing a lot of work on this, but I don't really have a good understanding of what that looks like. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough one too. Um, I'm actually missing a meeting right now of uh, various organizations on the Yukon River who are partnering now to talk about how we can all work together to better understand temperature and climate change impacts on the Yukon River. Um, this summer, our organization had intended to launch a pretty um, I guess, intensive temperature monitoring program along the entire stretch of the Yukon River um, and do both, you know, throughout the whole season, but giving us daily temperatures every single day so that we can um, respond more efficiently and effectively when we do start to see temperatures rise. Because what happened last summer is by the time we got the reports from people on the river and by the time we could assemble a team of scientists to go out, we were already two weeks late. So we already missed a lot of the, the salmon die off. And so we wanna be able to respond 
to these um, extreme heat events more efficiently moving forward so that we can better document them because the more you're able to document then the more we'll be able to understand future impacts to uh, returning salmon in the future. Um, it's, it's really hard to say, right, there's so many factors that impact our salmon and you know maybe five, six years from now when we start to see the returns of salmon coming back uh, from from the year class that spawned last year, it's hard to say what all impacted them. It could have been the one year where heat was really, really bad. It could be because there was a really warm year in the ocean. Um, it could be because there's a lot of hatchery competition out there. It's going to be really hard to narrow it down specifically to temperature. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in terms of management moving forward, the one thing that managers in the state of Alaska, Board of Fisheries, I think all need to keep in mind is um, the uncertainty around this and managing for climate uncertainty and how it's going to impact our fisheries. And maybe we, uh, maybe we need to pad, pad ourselves a little bit so that we're accounting for the potential, um, of, you know, potential impacts of climate on our salmon. Mm -hmm. And when you say pat ourselves, you're talking about the allowed harvest compared to the return levels. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm talking about allowing more fish to get to the spawning or managing so that we're able to get the adequate numbers of fish to the spawning grounds. But that might mean you have to be a little more conservative because you don't know just how many of those salmon are going to die en route to their spawning mm -hmm. grounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as I think, you know, you, we, you both kind of have touched on, there's so many intersecting issues here. And I would be remiss if we didn't mention the current uh, health pandemic that we're in the middle of and how we see that affecting our current situation and um, our, our, you know, our season. I know that, um, a colleague and a fisherman friend of mine, um, his whole uh, boat has changed. His crew has changed. What people feel comfortable doing changes. He's in Bristol Bay right now. And the ability to land and um, is is obviously impacted by um, this, this health pandemic we're facing of COVID-19. So I, I was wondering if... Um, maybe Dr. Gross, you could start us off to talk a little bit about the intersecting challenges that we face. Because um, as Dr. Quinn Davidson mentioned, it's not just warming temperatures, right? There are so many factors that lay into this. So um, I was wondering if you could address some of those and um, if, if you feel prepared to, to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and fishing relationship. Yeah, no, I was really interested to see how um, Alaska was going to approach that. Uh, I know Ann Zink uh, personally, and you know I've been keeping my my distance, obviously, for political reasons. But when when the issue of uh, whether or not to let the Bristol Bay fishery move forward or the fishery in Cordova uh, move forward came up, it really made me think a lot about this because, as you know, um, over 10% of health uh, workers are getting infected by COVID-19, and back in 1918. Uh, the villages in uh, Western Alaska got decimated by the flu, and they're very, very concerned about that happening again. And so introducing seafood workers from down south into uh, our plants in Cordova and Bristol Bay uh, very much puts those healthcare workers in, at risk for then uh, for community transmission, which will then go out into the villages. I thought from day one it made the most sense to establish a, hop, a hospital ship offshore and divert all COVID related issues to that ship and never let it go, go back to shore. That's not what they chose to do. They had plenty of time to do that, but chose not to. Uh, but I do think that Bristol Bay and the remote villages are now very much at risk because of COVID-19. And they've done what they can to try and um, quarantine the, the fishermen and the, the fisheries workers, but nothing's perfect. And as you can see what's happening with the numbers in Alaska, they're going up and they're gonna continue to go up for sure. Right, yeah. And I, I, I'm curious if I can prod you a little, you know, I, I know that you're busy with um, a whole other job of uh, trying to um, uh, get into an office where you can make more of a difference, right? Um, but I'm curious if um, there are 
I, or I guess for both of you, if you can talk a little bit more about that um, conflict and that, that competing kind of interest, because I think there's, there's so many things at play and one of them is a huge influx of outside fishermen coming into a small region. Um, and yeah, I, I just love to kind of explain that out a little bit more. Um, if one of you feels down to address that. It's improvisation. <laughs> uh, do you mean in terms of COVID or? I do know? mean in terms of COVID. Like I'm just thinking about how um, timely wise, you know, we're in such a such a deep health crisis. And as Dr. Gross mentioned, you know, there's there's ideas for um, ways to address this and there's health resources that perhaps aren't being met um, and hospital resources that aren't being met. And yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious to talk more about that. Although I know we could take the whole panel and talk about that. <laughs> so perhaps we best not. Well, I mean, I think the, the big thing with COVID is it's laid bare our disparities that we have in our system. And I think it's laying bare the, uh, how ill-equipped we are in these communities to handle public health crises. Um, and these are communities that are supporting huge industries and a lot of economy for Alaska. And just, um, I think if we're going to have these communities um, that are you know the jumping off points for such large industries and important economies then we need to be maybe investing in those communities to make sure that they're uh, well equipped to handle this this influx um, i think that uh, many of our communities are very gracious in allowing folks in to their communities to do these things who are not from from out there you know traveling along the yukon river um, we have places where folks are really wary of, of outsiders um, and rightfully so. And uh, the fact that we, we do have places where you can have thousands of people show up and use it as a jumping off point for all of those individuals to participate in this, uh, in this common, common resource pool <laughs> uh, fishery. Um, yeah, I think we need to think more broadly about how we can support these communities and make it be uh, a two-way street, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, That's really insightful. Um, I'd love, you know, we've uh, dived in with um, no snowballs of questions, only uh, big rocks and hard things to push aside and hard things to address and move. Um, so I'd love to kind of look at the the mossy side of the rock and maybe the upside. Is that the upside? Please say the word. Oh. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about, you know, what are the positive steps we can make, right? We've addressed so many of these problems, so many of these issues, hard to diagnose. What are the commitments perhaps we can ask of our leaders? Um, what should people like yourselves, Dr. Gross, be keeping in mind um, at the top of your head? Um, and what, yeah, what are the positive steps we can make? And um, I'm, I'm interested in the leadership level and the elected level, and I'm also interested in, you know, a societal and individual level. So again, um, a lot of moss, but perhaps um, hopefully a brighter, sunnier question. Um, and I, I, I might hand it to um, Dr. Gross to kick us off. Yeah, um, well, I mean, first of all, we have to fund uh, science to study the ocean and, you know, Bristol Bay and the acidi acidification, the warming, and we have to believe the science that, uh, that we obtain. That's really important. I've been very, very impressed with what NOAA does to study our oceans. Uh, they've got some really good scientists, but we can't we can't cut that funding, and it needs to be increased. And and you know, management of Alaska salmon has been very very successful, and our fisheries in general. The goal being for maximum sustainable yield. Well, the only way where you're going to have a maximum sustainable yield is if you know what the supply is, and uh, and so we the only way we can do that is to is to uh, do stream surveys and ocean surveys. And as a senator, I would be a strong supporter of that. 
you know, we haven't really talked much about the Pebble Mine here, but as I think most of you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the Pebble Mine. I think it really puts our fisheries at risk. Um, the risk versus benefit, uh, it's, it, the risk is just far outweighed by uh, the benefit of maintaining our fisheries. So I'm not a supporter. So we have to avoid projects that are going to imperil our, our fisheries whether it be transboundary mines up in Southeast Alaska, which are a big issue or the pebble mine, but it's not just mining, obviously it's, you know, acidification of our ocean. So I'm a, I'm a big supporter of federal funding uh, to you know, keep an eye on our oceans to make sure that we um, keep them healthy. Thank you, Dr. Gress. Hey, I like that fun, more science. That'll keep me in in employment. Uh huh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's there's two big things. Um, putting on my my hats, uh, certainly as a tribal advocate, putting that hat on. Um, I think that we need to involve tribes more in a lot of the decisions that are being made about our fisheries. Uh, right now, our fisheries are managed by the state of Alaska and and uh, by the federal government and tribes don't have a real seat at the table and you know that's what i do now is is to advocate for that and i think since um our tribal communities are at the front lines of climate change they need to be at the table as well and there are a lot of different ways that that can happen um through certainly legislation uh, but through co-management agreements memorandums of understanding moas that kind of stuff um, and funding programs for uh, tribal co-management programs uh, would be would be really good in this case. Um, and I think the other thing, just kind of echoing a little bit what Dr. Gross said, in that um, you know salmon are incredibly resilient. They've been around for a really long time, and they have the ability to adapt. But we need to give them that chance to adapt and. You know, they might be able to adapt to climate change, but if you add development on top of that and, you know, mining waste on top of that or in lots of dam uh, impervious surfaces that are washing away pollutants and sediment, or if you put up dams that restrict salmon's migration to their spawning grounds, right? All of that is making it less and less possible for them to more uh, easily adapt to changing climate. And so you have to ask yourself, um, you know, at what point is it, is it the straw that breaks the camel's back here? Um, we got we to gotta try and relieve some of the weight that the camel is carrying, uh, that our salmon are carrying as much as possible so that they can survive these um, changes in climate that are a little less hard to, uh, a little, or sorry, a little more hard to manage and um, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, well, I'm going to switch to some questions we've been getting through the chat and there's a Facebook chat going on and a Zoom chat going on. So I'm trying to manage both and uh, work in between with the help of um, our other Alaska Center folks. Um, so if I'm hopping around and I miss your question, I apologize in advance and um, I'll try to connect you um, to these wonderful doctors to um, help answer and get some clarity there too. And, and just on the notice that I think we have more questions than we can answer. Um, but with the next couple of 15 minutes, um, one thing to contextualize um, that I thought was a good question is, um, do we know the range of acceptable healthy water temperatures for salmon? Um, and do we have any baseline to compare the degree to which 2019, what you saw Dr. Quinn Davidson with salmon dying in those um, streams was um, an anomaly or was, was part of a trend? Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can answer the first question, um, and it's probably going to be a little different for every species of salmon. Um, but in general, we know that once water temperature hits 70 degrees, salmon become stressed. They start to show their stress. They become lethargic. You might see them moving near the surface very slowly, kind of floating near the surface. So that happens when the water temperature is 70 degrees. Um, as you get up towards 80 degrees, it becomes fatal for salmon um, for a variety of reasons. It's just too stressful to swim through. I mean, think, think about when you're going out for a run, 
you want to run when it's like 60 degrees out because or never. it's easier. <laughs> You, 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 if you try and go for a run when it's 90 degrees, it's really hard and you can't run as far and you get really tired. It's the same thing for salmon swimming up river when it's warm. Um, so that's the, that's what we're kind of looking at is when water temperatures start to hit 70 degrees and sustain that over multiple days, um, that becomes a concern. And that's what we had last summer is that it's not just that temperatures were warm, they were warm for an extended period of time. And that was the problem. If it's just a couple of days, salmon can swim deep or they can find cold water to hunker down in for a while. Uh, but if it extends for long periods of time, then it becomes really stressful on them. Um, what was the second question? <laughs> um, the second one was, uh, can oh, we, anomaly. yeah, can Isn't we gauge it? whether it's an anomaly or not? I mean, certainly that heat event that we had was an anomaly that like week and a half, 10 days at the beginning of July last summer where we did see the die off, that was an anomaly. That was above, I think Sue Mauger in her work has shown that the temperatures that we reached in that period of time, water temperatures, were what we are expecting 50 years from now. Um, so well out of the range of our models and what mm. we would expect. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. That's helpful. Um, I think another question that just came in that um, I'd love to prompt you both with is um, whether uh, the question was about the state, but I might ask it about the state and the nation. Um, if we have any sort of policy or attitude that's formalized towards global warming, are we passive about this or are we being active actors on climate change? And um, Perhaps um, I'll let I'll let one of you handle it. Who prefers to answer first? Well, under President Trump, we're certainly not active participants, and we're actively um, going the other direction. I think we need to join back up on the worldwide discussion level by joining back with the Paris Climate Accords, which, by the way, we're not binding, but you know, it brings people to the table to have a discussion and share information. You know, Trump just pulled us out of the World Health Organization recently. Uh, there are certain things that I think we should come together and share information and work together as a world to try and save our world. Uh, climate change is one of those issues. Um, uh, healthcare is another. So I don't think that the Trump administration has been successful at all in addressing uh, the problem. Uh, nor will they even accept uh, man's uh, um, um, influence on our changing climate. And uh, Dan Sullivan and Trump are both big time climate change deniers. Um, it, you know, man, man's input to our changing climate may not be the only reason why our, change, why our climate's changing, but you, if you have any kind of appreciation for science whatsoever, you can't deny the science that we are very much uh, in part responsible for our changing climate. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. Um, like Stephanie, would you would you be um, willing to address this question on more of a state level um, in policy and attitudes towards climate change and <laughs> whether we're a strong actor, um, a passive. Uh, I keep wanting to say pebble with the stream running by us, but that's, that brings up some other things, um, yeah. whether we're more passive, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as a whole, um, we're probably pretty passive, but I think that there are individuals within the system who are much more active. Um, you know, I think about as a whole, you know, fishing game doesn't really have a climate policy when it comes to salmon um, and addressing, you know, salmon management. That said, I know that there are some managers who always have that in the back of their mind who are thinking about it. Um, so it's, if you have some good actors who are working within the, the system, um, who are trying to promote some more active uh, approaches and change that's certainly useful, but we're not seeing that come down, you know, from top down. It's, it's all going to be organic um, from the bottom up from folks at this point. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I just want to promote to folks, if they haven't read it, um, 
if you haven't read King of Fish yet, um, I think the, is it the thousand year journey of salmon? <laughs> um, but King of Fish is a really remarkable book um, and is one that really transformed my way of thinking about salmon in Alaska. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but I feel like in Alaska, especially with our management entities, we have this view of Alaska exceptionalism that we're just, you know, we have, there's so many salmon out there. There's so much habitat. It's so pristine. It's so wild that nothing bad could come of our salmon. Um, and I think that's really the wrong viewpoint to have here. And the Alaska exceptionalism is what creates this passive Passive, you know, passiveness. There we go. And um, we have an opportunity to be the leaders. Um, and we have an opportunity to rewrite a, a different history for salmon in Alaska. And that is going to take a more active approach than what we're taking right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, there's, uh, again, too many questions for us to address um, in this short time, but um, this might be the last one pending how long we take to answer it. Um, and it's another softie. So, you know, just a 30 second address. None of these have been softies, by none the way. Of them, none of them. <laughs> Not a single one. No, nope. this has been very hard. <laughs> and you're both doing a marvelous job of uh, addressing really, really large questions in um, a short amount of time. Um, but to touch on something that I think you both talked about, um, Stephanie, you mentioned more tribal involvement in management of fish, and Dr. Gross, you mentioned funding more science as a step that we can take and a couple of other concrete um, means. And I think I'm coming from a perspective where I'm really curious, um, and part of the Alaska Center's work is to um, heighten local awareness, especially with youth, to connect with people on this issue. And I'm wondering, um, to connect on that human level, um, what can we do? If you guys see any avenues, or if in your, in your lives, your um, doing work to connect on this issue with folks? Well, I was up at AFN last year when uh, the youth brought forward the resolution to declare a climate change emergency, which uh, was a very contentious issue and ultimately passed and led to Arctic Slope Regional Corporation withdrawing from a AFN in protest. Uh, but the youth in Alaska are very, very passionate about this issue. And it's hard to get the youth passionate about issues uh, and involved politically. And so I think we should take full advantage of the fact that, that young people uh, want to be involved and to spread the message and to do everything they can to prevent this uh, from perpetuating into the future. So I would engage the youth as much as we can and the indigenous people and listen to them uh, who are speaking out uh, really broadly on the issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really moving moment um, for folks that uh, I, I, I also had the privilege to be there at AFN when that resolution passed and um, that discussion was, uh, um, yeah, extremely moving and extremely important. Um, Stephanie, I know that you have a lot of uh, connection um, additionally to a, um, a campaign last year that, um, or sorry, the previous year that um, tried to address this connection um, of these intersecting challenges and issues and solutions. Um, and I, I'm curious if you have any lessons learned there. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, at least in terms of engaging youth, um, the one thing that I've learned from our Canadian counterparts in the Yukon Territory, um, you know, they have, um, they've instituted moratoriums on salmon fishing for some of the First Nations for 15 years because they are trying to rebuild the salmon runs back up to historical numbers. And they have taken that um, choice, they've made that choice to, um, to sacrifice for future generations. But as a result, their youth are not growing up at fish camp. They're not growing up cutting fish. They um, aren't learning the traditional knowledge that previously had been passed down for generations. So I think 
it's important, you know, and one thing the Alaska Center could do is, um, in, you know, work more with culture camps and finding ways to connect youth and people on the river uh, to salmon um, in a way that balances conservation, but also teaches those traditional ways of life and partnering with a lot of organizations that are already doing this. Um, and I think the other thing to do is just helping the cross-cultural education of it and maybe doing some, um, you know, some culture sharing of taking some of our urban youth out into rural Alaska to learn about what fish camp is all about and to have, see that real connection out in fish camp um, and, uh, and vice versa. So just some ideas. Mm, thank you. Thank you both so much. And um, I, I hope that um, we're, we're uh, closing or coming to a close at a point where I think we're looking at both sides of the stone of these issues and recognizing that um, we're trying to push um, on problems that are so long and so ingrained, but we're also learning um, from people who've been solving these problems for millennia um, for the existence of time itself. And um, I, I just feel so grateful to both of you for your time and your willingness to join us in this conversation um, with the knowledge that it's really hard and there's no really easy answers um, and no really easy questions either. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate um, both of your willingness to join us in this conversation and I will um, start to uh, bring us to a close and recognize that um, there's a lot of questions that haven't been asked. So um, I, I don't know if there's a good way to get in touch with um, these two doctors to address them. Um, perhaps I'll give you both a moment to, if folks have other questions or a way to follow up, um, what would be a good way to continue learning and continue this conversation? Well, right. you, can, you, can contact, you can contact me at our campaign al at algrossak.com uh, and be happy to uh, field whatever uh, emails. Another, another contact is corona um, at dralgrossak.com and Monica and I have been trying to answer questions through that um, on track too. But we haven't talked about much about habitat and wetlands, but clearly that's a big part of this as well. And I think you have to look at the big picture, the whole circle for salmon if you want to protect them. And I know some of that's not federal, some of that state, but we have to keep an eye on the big picture if we're going to maintain our salmon runs. Really, really important. And as a senator, I'm I'm very excited to be part of that because I I love the water. It's my happy place, and I love being out catching fish, so or killing fish, I should say. But <laughs> uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gross. And Dr. QD, is there a way that folks should <laughs> bug you with questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm more than welcome folks to email me. Um, my personal email is stephqd, so that's s-t-e-p-h-q-d at gmail.com. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'll respond there. Um, my Twitter handle is salmonstephak. Uh, Steph is with a p-h. Um, I try and post a lot of salmon-related content on Twitter. Um, yeah, happy, happy to answer questions. I know I saw some come through on the Facebook comments too that folks had about some of the science. I'm happy to respond to those. Once I log off of here, I can respond to those comments directly on the Facebook uh, live post. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you both. Well, I know that we're a little bit over time, so I will bring us to a close. Um, I'll, I'll remind folks to continue these types of conversations this is a series of the Alaska Center and we want to have a lot of these climate conversations. Obviously, they're all pretty heavy and pretty deep, but um, I uh, have certainly learned um, a shocking number of things uh, in this conversation. So I, I hope to continue doing that. Um, 
uh, in these future conversations. Next Friday, um, we're going to have a conversation about Black identities and sustainability um, hosted by the Alaska Center. So you can follow our Facebook page um, and all of the social media to find us there. Um, and of course, you should follow both of these two wonderful doctors who, again, I'm just so grateful for your time, um, for your knowledge, for your vulnerability in sharing this, and for your willingness to talk about a tough topic. Um, it's really, really appreciated. And um, thank you so, so much. And thank you to everybody for attending. I, I appreciate all of our time. So with that, I think I will bring us to a close. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. We'll do the Zoom webinar wave. You know how on Zoom we all wave goodbye? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye.